Hi, uh, uh, my name is Ben Schmidt. Uh, I am the Lord Commander of Security Research at NARF Industries. Uh, and this is Paul Mikowski. Uh, Hi, uh, my name is Paul Mikowski. Um, somehow Ben slipped into the presentation that I am the assistant to the professor, to the presenter. <laughs> Uh, my title at NARF Industries is Director of World Domination. Um, so hopefully I'm not uh, too much of an assistant uh, <laughs> and I can actually contribute. Um, um, today we're going to be talking about uh, embedded security in Japanese uh, home routers. Um, we did some surveys of various devices and found some, we think, interesting vulnerabilities. Uh, uh, so the, the, the reason why it's kind of funny that I missed this insertion on the slide <laughs> uh, about how I'm the assistant is we've gone through uh, four revisions of these slides. Um, we've been asked to uh, omit uh, some details of um, some vulnerabilities that uh, are still being coordinated uh, with the affected vendors. Um, so uh, I missed the fact that he added in the assistant line uh, four times uh, to these slides. Um, so it still came out in the end. Worked perfectly. Uh, but going hand in hand with that, you'll see a lot of black bars um, in this presentation, um, which we hope are uh, entertaining. Um, but not as informative as we would have hoped. Um, we hope eventually to fully release the details that were on the slide, but uh, for now, we can't. Um, so in this talk, we're going to cover uh, sort of the motivation behind we, why we started doing this, mostly just because we were interested and it seemed fun. Um, but uh, we, we also wanted to explore how fast you could go from absolutely no knowledge about the embedded devices in a given country uh, to having remote code execution as root on, on many of these devices. We wanted to do this simply as an exercise that sort of demonstrates the state of embedded security today. Uh, so we're gonna cover sort of the landscape uh, as it is today. Uh, specifically in Japan. Um, we're going to analyze some of the attack surfaces that we discovered, uh, some of the many vulnerabilities that we found during our research, uh, and give some demos of how these exploits work, how easy they are to use, and how powerful they are uh, in the access that you're able to gain. And then we're going to talk about all the remediation steps that we hope uh, affected vendors and really any embedded device manufacturers uh, should be using and should start using as soon as possible. So why did we decide to uh, look at and hack uh, Japanese routers? Well, for one, uh, we, we did some looking around and we couldn't find very much public research on the topic. Uh, we were only f able to find a single blog that even took these devices apart uh, and posted uh, pictures of it online. We, this is sort of odd for someone from the United States because we see uh, that pretty much any router that gets shipped there uh, that you could purchase in a, in a store, someone somewhere tore it down or the FCC released uh, tear down pictures that you can then inspect and look at. But we couldn't find very much information at all um, in our searching. And also, we're, we're kind of lovers of junk hacking. We take things apart because they're interesting. <laughs> um, some people don't, uh, Dave I tell. Uh, but I think uh, it's actually a very useful exercise. And in this case, it actually has very severe uh, consequences. These, these routers matter a lot. Um, many of them listen on the WAN. They're very slow to update. Uh, there are a lot of vendors involved with updating them. They have to go through sometimes five, six, seven different vendors before uh, 
patches actually get implemented and then shipped back through all of those vendors before they actually get released to consumers. And they are notoriously insecure. Uh, Japan, uh, but mostly what we're going to focus on during this talk is our UPnP vulnerabilities that we discovered because it is one of the most common services that is exposed on the, uh, on the, WAN, on the WAN side. So uh, China <laughs> has an exceptional number of these, but uh, Japan still has an impressive number, especially by population, that are exposed remotely to attackers. But we'll talk a little more about UPnP later. So when we started this research, we knew nothing other than we thought it might be interesting to look at some of these routers. We've looked at other embedded devices before, but uh, nothing from Japan. Um, so this was new territory for us. Uh, and we did this research in the US uh, where we didn't have ready access to Japanese infrastructure or devices. Um, so we started out uh, just taking a look at firmwares. Yes. Uh, and we were in the United States during all of this, so we did not have any access to uh, hardware to play with. Uh, all we had access to really were firmware images we were able to find and discover. And there are many barriers that make it difficult to study foreign embedded devices. One is very much the language. Um, it, you need to know how to search for what you want. You need to know how to find what you want. Thankfully, we have a couple people <laughs> at our company that uh, could translate for us. But it, it was somewhat difficult uh, getting started. Uh, infrastructure very, very widely. Uh, as do the devices themselves from country to country, how they're set up, what their internals look like, how, uh, how secured uh, they are, how much research has been done on them. And obviously acquiring hardware and things for testing was very difficult, especially in Japan where most of the routers uh, used by people at home are leased rather than purchased, uh, which is not the case in many other countries. Um, and all those things came together to make it much more difficult to study some of these devices. Um, and we did have some difficulties with power, uh, trying not to set my apartment on fire. We, uh, only a little bit of smoke and melted plastic, but uh, a, pa uh, a power supply solved that. <laughs> yeah. We, uh, we started with just the firmwares, um, but as I'll explain later, um, when we tore apart the firmwares, uh, we decided which devices were worth acquiring and shipping uh, to the US. Um, so these devices came with warning labels like you see on the slide. Um, and yes, we kind of burnt a few. Um, our power specs aren't exactly the same <laughs> as Japanese power specs. Um, so we'll have to be more careful. <laughs> But thankfully, nothing too bad happened. Um, so from, from our initial looks through these devices, and honestly, through most of our prior work with embedded devices, uh, there's usually very few technical uh, obstacles to exploitation. Uh, very rarely do you have ASLR, address based layout randomization, um, which makes it much more difficult to exploit memory corruption vulnerabilities because you don't know where existing code lies. Um, most of them do not have DEP, no execute uh, in use, and if they do, it's not complete, so it's actually rather ineffective. Uh, many of them do have stack or heap cookies, but it's probably just because of their tool chain. Uh, more recent versions of GCC or any other compiler they're using should be putting those in by default. Occasionally, manufacturers will disable those for speed reasons, which is a horrible decision. But uh, often, to, uh, very, very often, uh, those are enabled. Um, sometimes safe unlinking, heap hardening, uh, verifying the uh, heap metadata that could be corrupted if a heap buffer is overflown. 
sometimes is enabled. It's often accidental and entirely based on what uh, version of glibc or ulibc that they ended up using. Uh, and oftentimes they'll use older versions because why update? It still works. If it's, uh, if it's not broken, why fix it? Yeah. Um, the important uh, thing to take away from this slide is any exploit mitigations that are present on these devices is typically accidental uh, rather than intentional. Um, they happen to, the manufacturers happen to use a recent enough GCC or link against a recent enough libc, uh, but they are not proactively going out and trying to use these mitigations uh, like you see on workstations. Uh, so very different. And uh, almost across the board, everything runs as root for speed. <laughs> Uh, because it's much faster if you do not need to check uh, permissions before you do things. It's so much easier when you just run everything as root. Uh, this is not good, uh, and they should be using a lot of sandboxing, especially in network-exposed processes. And it's also important to note that this is not just uh, on Japanese embedded devices. Uh, this is kind of common across all embedded devices, uh, um, really, um, internationally. Um, they're very, in a lot of respects, uh, difficult or costly to update. Um, and like I said, if it's not broken, uh, why fix it? Um, a lot of people don't feel the need to update unless they're under active attack. Um, unfortunately, as you hear in the news today, a lot of times uh, people simply aren't aware that they're under attack. Um, so we're hoping uh, this sort of research uh, spurs, uh, um, in, in encourages uh, embedded device manufacturers uh, to uh, think more seriously about um, some of these low cost mitigations. Uh, and the landscape of embedded devices uh, in Japan, but really all over the world uh, is what you would expect from the internet of things, a term I'm not particularly fond of, but I felt like I had to use. The, uh, there are routers, obviously, but there's also uh, modem, anything from modems to uh, Wi-Fi hotspots to webcams, as I'm sure many people have seen if they've looked at the news recently. Uh, and even things like internet connected picture frames, which, uh, Surprisingly, some people hook directly up to the internet and uh, let, let various people do whatever they want to. There's many other examples of these devices and they're too numerous to count. And in the future, they're, they're only going to, uh, that number of devices is only going to increase. We even have a, a webcam in the audience back there. Somebody is <laughs> telepresence. Uh, so these things are ubiquitous. Uh, they're everywhere. Um, uh, so here is the first of many black boxes um, that you will see in this presentation. Um, so what we did is, and I mentioned this before, uh, we grabbed as many uh, firmwares as we could um, uh, from as many devices as we could find uh, and different rever revisions of the firmware as well. Um, and because we didn't have any Japanese devices on hand, um, we first set out to try to find uh, what might be the easiest to pull apart firmwares and uh, the easiest to analyze. Um, and so uh, on, the, on this slide and the next one, you see a few examples. Uh, um, now these are not, uh, these are not uh, the firmwares that contain uh, the vulnerabilities we'll discuss later. Uh, but these are just some uh, uh, firmwares that we pulled apart. Um, and these firmwares vary uh, widely in uh, how difficult they are to extract and analyze. Um, so on the easy end of the spectrum, uh, you have a particular class of firmware uh, from OKI. Uh, this firmware um, is distributed as a dot bin. <laughs> which is actually a .tar.gz. Uh, it's just called a .bin. 
And when you extract it, it's just two partitions. Um, and you can mount these partitions under Linux uh, and take a look at all of the um, programs and settings uh, that, is, that are distributed with this, uh, with this firmware. Um, now, that's, that's simple. Uh, and actually, a lot of that process is automated by tools like uh, Binwalk. Um, if you've ever used the file uh, command on Linux systems, um, the way that that works is it just looks uh, for some magic bytes in the file. Uh, and then we'll tell you what type of file it is. Uh, what Binwalk does is you will hand it a large binary blob and it will go byte by byte into that blob and run the same file sequence over each byte. Um, so you may have a binary blob that you don't know what it is, uh, but say 100 bytes in, it is a tar gzip. Um, so uh, Binwalk knows how to extract that part of the file. Uh, just take a look at that part uh, and then extract that. Um, and uh, it automates that whole process, including even mounting the file system and pulling the files out. Uh, so very simple. Um, uh, so that, that's on the easy side of the spectrum. Uh, slightly more difficult is uh, there was a firmware from uh, NEC uh, that appeared as though it was encrypted. Um, so one, uh, one recurring theme that you'll see in this presentation is uh, we did this research for fun uh, in our spare time. Uh, so we were going for the lowest hanging fruit, the easiest vulnerabilities. Um, a firmware that is encrypted is not the easiest vulnerabilities to find. Um, so we didn't look as hard there. Uh, that's not to say uh, that there aren't vulnerabilities in those firmwares, um, but it just simply wasn't the path of least resistance. Um, so in that case, uh, there's likely some firmware uh, that's encrypted. Um, now, the way that you typically get around that kind of scenario, if you don't understand the encryption, is you get a device, you open it up, uh, and a lot of times there will be uh, serial leads, UART leads, uh, that you can probe. Um, and many of these devices, uh, the ones that we tested at least, uh, will simply give you a root shell um, if you hook up to them. Uh, and if there's no serial, a lot of times there's JTAG. Um, so very handy. Uh, so A lot less fun, but very handy. <laughs> um, so if you're unsure how this firmware is encrypted, you can dump a current installation uh, and then take a look at the algorithms and reverse them. Uh, that's not something we did, simply because uh, why try harder? Um, yeah, next one. Uh, in, in one case, uh, we took a look at a class of Buffalo firmwares uh, that, used, uh, that tried to use encryption. Uh, they didn't do it quite right. Um, if they're actually trying to protect the contents. Um, they used a modified RC4 cipher with a static key, and that key is Buffalo. <laughs> um, so all of their firmware, yes, is encrypted. Technically. Technically. Um, but realistically, it doesn't deter us. Uh, well, that's not true. Um, it did get Paul to waste a lot of his own time. So I initially tried to reverse engineer this encryption um, in IDA. Thank you. Uh, and uh, I, I got to the point that I realized that this was RC4. And I realized what the key was. And it wasn't working uh, when I tried to decrypt it. Turns out they just use two more rounds than the normal RC4. Um, and we ended up finding. OpenWRT has an encrypt decrypt tool for these firmwares. So I spent several days trying to understand this encryption, and there's a tool out there that did it for us that's open source. Um, that was my preferred way. Yeah. So we use the tool uh, from then on. Um, 
So this is a very small sample of the uh, different types of firmwares we pulled apart. Um, we're going to talk about some vulnerabilities later. Uh, these, these examples aren't affected by those vulnerabilities. Um, and there's going to be, uh, we're hoping that when uh, we have a coordinated release uh, later, that we can release more information on other firmwares uh, so that people can replicate uh, the extraction process and do their own analysis. So as far as the attack surface uh, we found on these devices is, uh, it's what you would expect from pretty much any normal embedded router. Uh, you've got HTTP, uh, by far is the most common way to uh, configure and manage these devices. Uh, in uh, our research in Japan, most of these HTTP servers are actually not exposed on the WAN, however which greatly reduces the uh, attack surface of the routers. Uh, however, some uh, FTP servers were exposed, uh, which is a problem, but UPnP by far was the most common embedded port uh, that was remotely exposed. And when WAN facing, this is uh, an extremely bad problem because oftentimes, almost across the board, these servers are not well written, they're not well tested, and uh, simply exposing it on the WAN port opens you up to uh, uh, attacks that involve forwarding internal ports to uh, external interfaces, which can allow you to not only attack internal services on the routers, but also attack other hosts inside of the network. Which, great, uh, which oftentimes these hosts are not well protected, they're not patched because people were relying on NAT to protect them from remote attackers. And they no longer have that barrier between them and the internet, which makes it uh, a huge problem. So you have file shares that suddenly become exposed, you suddenly can exploit unpatched vulnerabilities, um, and uh, you can access internal web servers. You can do lots and lots of really bad things simply because that's exposed without actually exploiting the daemon in any real way. So we're definitely not the first people to look at UPnP. Uh, Rapid7 did an awesome report on UPnP security uh, a couple years ago and their findings were definitely quite severe. Um, they focused on the most widely used uh, SDKs for UPnP, uh, Intel, Mini UPnP, and a couple other unknown SDKs that basically are Broadcom SDKs. And these, uh, each one that they looked at, uh, people found vulnerabilities in, um, and there's probably more still existing in that code base. It's been looked at more than it had been previously, but it's still very dangerous to expose that on the WAN port. Uh, however, uh, we decided that not enough people had looked at the other category. It's a very large chunk, the fourth largest, um, and oftentimes these vulnerabilities are, uh, these servers have vulnerabilities in them because no one has ever looked at them to analyze their security. No one has ever even tried to figure out who wrote the software. Oftentimes it's not maintained anymore. Um, it's, and all of these things are still exposed on the internet. Um, so, uh, to get an idea of just how exposed uh, Japan in particular is uh, to these services, we used Shodan. If you haven't heard of it before, um, it's basically a search engine for vulnerable devices. Um, you can search on common ports that embedded devices use uh, and find uh, per country uh, where these services are listening. So. In the case of our black box UPnP daemon, um, we found over 3 million hosts in Japan 
uh, searching for UPnP running, running this daemon and almost none anywhere else. Columbia, for some reason, has 63,000 reported ones. No idea why. Uh, we found this to be very interesting because it meant that there was a native uh, UPnP daemon that is used in Japan and nowhere else, which means that it probably hasn't been looked at a lot. A lot of countries show this very uh, unique fingerprint uh, when it comes to the home routers used in their countries because oftentimes ISPs source from native uh, manufacturers because it's easier with the language barriers uh, and it's quicker to get whatever devices they need into the country. So uh, oftentimes what this means is countries' ISP infrastructure is very unique to their country, and it means that it exposes very unique vulnerabilities that may be overlooked by people looking at global patterns. Um, however, it's very important for countries to look at these devices that are running on their infrastructure and their infrastructure only, because if someone wants to uh, attack your country for some reason, um, then they're very definitely going to be looking for these sorts of problems. Um, our own research, we, uh, just because Shodan uh, can sometimes overestimate the number of hosts, uh, because IP addresses may be dynamic and change, um, our own research indicated that there were significantly less of these devices than what Shodan reports, um, between two and 300,000 hosts. However, this is still a very, very large number, um, and there's any number of things that you can do with a botnet that is very easy to build uh, of that size, and we'll talk about some of those. So, um, as you as you probably notice, uh, another one of the things we had to black box is um, the means to identify uh, this particular daemon. Uh, so uh, we will refer to this as the black box UPnP daemon. Um, hopefully, uh, in the coming months, uh, we can release uh, full details. Um, but this. This UPnP daemon is really computer science security 101. Um, it is the type of program that you would hand to undergraduate students uh, who are learning about buffer overflows, uh, who are learning about format string attacks, um, and are even looking for logic bugs. Um, pretty much every type of vulnerability is represented in this daemon. Um, and uh, we just had fun uh, trying to find um, as many as we could. Um, it turned out to be shockingly easy. Um, now, this wouldn't be so big of a deal if uh, this daemon wasn't running on somewhere, by our, by our research, uh, somewhere between 200 and 300,000 hosts in Japan uh, and listening uh, on the internet. Um, so with that, that number of hosts in Japan, uh, you know, you could cause a lot of damage to Japanese infrastructure, and we'll talk about what exactly you could do with that number of hosts in a few minutes. Um, but this, this daemon has, it has, it has everything. Uh, it's got uh, buffer overflows on the stack, uh, if you're more into exploiting buffer overflows on the heap, it's got that for you too. Um, it's got logic bugs um, and uh, a bunch of other problems elsewhere in other daemons on the same device. So this is a fun slide. <laughs> um, <laughs> Initially, this slide actually showed some code. Um, can, can you guys spot the vulnerability? <laughs> it's, it's more difficult now to spot the vulnerabilities. <laughs> um, so this is in this UPnP daemon. Um, 
Now, you don't really need to know a whole lot else behind those black bars. Um, you see you've got uh, an attacker controlled string uh, going into a sprintf. Um, now this one in particular is not vulnerable to a format string bug um, because it's going into a percent %f, or sorry, percent %s. Um, but you'll notice it's a sprintf, uh, not an sn printf or anything that checks bounds. Uh, so that's the format string equivalent of a stir copy. It's just going to keep copying uh, until it hits a null byte. Checking length slows you down. Yes. Uh, yeah, when, uh, when you're developing an embedded device, a lot of times there's pressure uh, to be as cost effective as possible and a lot of times security checks slow you down. Uh, in the financial sector, um, it's actually intentional in a lot of respects uh, to ignore um, security checks. Uh, also, GPUs in, uh, in desktops and whatnot, their drivers uh, intentionally omit security checks. In this case, I don't think it was intentionally omitted. Uh, this daemon listens to internet traffic. So if it was intentional, it should not have been. Um, so, uh, is the next one. Did you talk about the system yet, though? Not yet. That's the most fun. Not yet. All right, so <laughs> behind this black bar right there, there's a buffer. Um, and that buffer is on the stack. So this sprintf is going to copy an attacker-controlled length onto a stack buffer. And we all know what kind of fun you can have with that. Um, so that's, that's one of the vulnerabilities. I'm kind of telling you the answers here because we blacked out all of the actual code. Um, you want to hit it again? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so there's, uh, so the attacker controls two different sprint Fs, overflows two different buffers. Um, so that's, that's fun. And you can use this, these vulnerabilities to gain code execution. Um, but uh, what you don't see in, in the, it's covered in black is uh, this particular function has stack cookies. Um, so you, you'd have to have some kind of evasion to the stack cookies. And that's hard. And we weren't trying really hard. Uh, we wanted to get uh, the easy win. Um, so why try harder? Oh, it's already up. Great. Um, so why try harder? Uh, the string that's being sprint effed into is passed directly to system. Uh, so this daemon will take traffic from the internet, this daemon's running as root, and will pass it directly into system. And it will execute any command that you give it. And we found this function initially. The first thing we did was search for calls to system. And the first one we looked at was this function. Yeah. Um, so uh, hit it again. So, <laughs> uh, and also there. Um, so you've got two buffer overflows, uh, two command injections, and hit it one more time, in four lines of code. Um, so uh, yeah, why, why try harder? This, this is the easiest. Um, these are the easiest bugs to exploit. Um, and this is how we initially gained code execution on this particular vulnerable device. Uh, and we use that code execution to find more vulnerabilities. So the vulnerabilities don't stop here, uh, including uh, there's more vulnerabilities in uh, the UPnP daemon itself. Um, but uh, we already won on the UPnP daemon. Uh, why try to find more? Uh, so we started looking at the other daemons that were listening, um, and that includes an HTTP daemon. Uh, so, all right. So before we get to the HTTP bugs, uh, we want to show you a little demo of, and this is going to be um, because we're omitting the details of the vulnerability and how to trigger it. Uh, this is going to be a very uh, plain very boring video. 
Um, you have to trust us. Uh, we are actually running an exploit. Okay, so what we're doing here, if you can see, okay, so we have an exploit called shell.py. Um, we had acquired this Japanese uh, device and it is on our local network. Um, we're not doing this over the internet. Um, uh, and we run our exploit against it. And we get a root shell. Um, so that took just a few seconds. Um, and what we're exploiting there is the vulnerabilities that we just discussed uh, where it, um, we have command injection. Um, so we, we run a few commands to demonstrate that we are in fact root on this device. Um, and that's it for that demo. <laughs> um, you know, uh, if I did show you the c exploit code, it would be really boring as well um, because it is so simple. Um, it's, it's how many lines? <laughs> Uh, the, ex the exploit is also probably about four lines of code. <laughs> All right, uh, so the fun doesn't stop there though. Um, there's other daemons running on this device. Uh, why don't we take a look at them? So now that we have a root shell on this device, we can try probing other daemons uh, and um, dynamically executing them uh, the vendor who uh, built this device was kind enough to include a GDB server on the device. So we could even set up remote GDB debugging connections uh, to these daemons. So that's very helpful. Um, now this, this device had an HTTP server as well. This HTTP server uh, was not listening on the internet by default. Um, but that doesn't matter so much. Um, so like Ben had said before, the fact that this device is listening to the internet uh, for UPnP uh, means that this device uh, can potentially be reconfigured uh, to forward ports uh, to the internal network, including its own ports. Um, so you have this HTTP server running that's supposed to only be listening on the LAN, but you have a UPnP server that's listening to commands from the internet, you can instruct the UPnP server to forward the LAN port to the internet. So this HTTP server by default is not listening to the internet, but you can cause it to listen to the internet. Uh, so we found several vulnerabilities uh, in this daemon as well. Uh, this daemon is another uh, indigenous, uh, very unique um, to Japan um, daemon. Uh, and it was, it was uh, clearly written, it was purpose built uh, for these embedded devices. Um, it wasn't, it's not Apache, it's not Nginx, it's not IAS or anything famous. Uh, it was actually pretty difficult, uh, and we spent some time trying to figure out uh, who the vendor was that wrote this daemon and the UPnP daemon because we wanted to tell them about these vulnerabilities. Uh, and they didn't put their name anywhere in the binaries. So it was very difficult to track them down. Um, so this, this bug, uh, it's an interesting bug. Um, so in this case, uh, they seemingly actually tried uh, for security, um, but they made a mistake. Um, so the HTTP daemon, uh, if you issue a get command uh, to the HTTP daemon, it will copy uh, the um, path that you requested into a heap buffer. The problem is that heap buffer is sized according to the content length header that you pass to the device as part of the request. So there's a sanity check that checks to see whether or not uh, the buffer is sufficiently sized to hold the path that's going to be copied into it. 
The problem is, um, after that sanity check, the size is promoted from an signed integer to an unsigned integer, and that length, the unsigned length, is copied into the buffer. Um, so, uh, and it causes massive overflow and just destroys the process space. Um, so, the uh, part of the reason we decided to to show this one is because uh, exploitability is difficult um, in this case. Uh, however, uh, it the proof of concept is so short uh, that it gives you an idea of how many vulnerabilities are present in this in this daemon. It, it should be noted, all of these uh, uh, vulnerabilities, they've been reported. Um, and uh, we've, we've uh, coordinated disclosure with the affected parties. Uh, part of that is all of the black bars you see today. Um, uh, and uh, we're omitting details about how you um, fingerprint uh, these daemons. Um, so we don't want people to take malicious use of this information but we wanted to provide you with some kind of idea of the severity of the issues uh, plaguing these devices. Um, so like I mentioned before, um, there is a signedness comparison issue in the content length header. So if you specify a negative content length, it's going to improperly allocate a heap buffer, and then it's going to copy um, uh, way too much data than it should. Um, so this, this, is, uh, this is slightly longer than our other proof of concept. This is five lines. <laughs> our previous exploit was four. Um, so we're getting into really complex territory here. Um, <laughs> so uh, we have a demo of this one as well. Oh. We'll jump ahead then. Oh, are we jumping ahead? No. We can do a demo. So this one is slightly more interesting. Um, we had previously shown you getting a root shell via the UPnP vulnerability. Uh, now we're going to use that same vulnerability to get that root shell, uh, and then we're going to do more things with it. Okay, so in the top, the top left, uh, we have that root shell again and that was the UPnP vulnerability. Uh, now in the bottom left, uh, we are setting up uh, GDB on our, uh, on our testing laptop. Switching back to the top left, uh, we do a process <coughs> listing and determine what the uh, process ID is of the HTTP server. So what we have in the top left is we had attached uh, um, GDB server to uh, the affected uh, binary. Um, and then in the bottom left, we are doing a remote uh, debugging session uh, with the device. And as you can probably tell from previous slides, uh, this particular device is an ARM device. Uh, so um, we're using a, a version of uh, uh, GDB compiled with ARM support. All right, so we have, uh, we have control over uh, the execution of this daemon. And now we open a last terminal. And we send uh, the contents of what was on the previous slide which is in heap overflow.py. Um, and as you can see in the bottom left slide, we cause a seg fault in the daemon. We didn't actually, yeah. uh, we didn't actually take this to full code execution um, because we already had full code execution. So again, why try harder? So 
this HTTP daemon, um, I mentioned there was uh, some logic vulnerabilities as well. Um, and uh, this is just your standard vanilla path traversal vulnerability. Um, so uh, this is another computer science security 101 problem. Um, if you specify a path that you're going to request that is outside of the HTTP route, um, the HTTP daemon should not serve you that path. Uh, this daemon does. Um, and the proof of concept uh, for this vulnerability is our shortest one yet. Uh, it is two lines. Um, so what we have here is uh, you just uh, import Python requests and then what we're requesting is outside of uh, the HTTP route. We use the dot dot slash to get outside of it. And then we're requesting this XML file and that, that XML file contains passwords. Um, so if you're on the local network, um, or if you're a remote attacker, but if you're on the local network, you could make this request to your friends uh, or your enemies' um, uh, router and uh, get their admin password for the router. Um, so that's not good. Uh, and we have a demo for this as well. And this is our last demo. So we don't actually request the file I just showed you. Uh, again, this is us getting an interactive root shell. And now, in this case, we echo foo into slash temp slash bar, just as a demo. And then in our other terminal, we issue what I just showed on the last slide and we get the contents of slash temp slash bar. This becomes even more fun when you start dumping things like uh, dev kmem. Which is uh, directly dumping kernel memory, which is fun. So why does this matter? Uh, well, you can do a lot of things with 200 to 300,000 hosts and even more so when they're, when they're home routers that are protecting a large number of other devices on the network. First of all, uh, you can very clearly violate the privacy of thousands of people um, and capture all the traffic entering and leaving that network. This also allows you to impersonate the people uh, who are using these devices. You can man in the middle their connections exploit uh, end hosts on their network so that you can build an even larger botnet. Um, you could use this as a way to hide the true source of other attacks by routing them through these devices and make it appear that um, innocent home, uh, uh, homeowners and uh, people with these devices uh, are initiating attacks that they're coming from Japan when they could be coming from anywhere in the world. And possibly worst of, worst of all, it could very well cripple national infrastructure because of the sheer amount of data that you're able to send from these devices. Japan is very lucky to have uh, very, uh, many, many high speed connections to the internet. However, this creates problems when many hosts on those networks are compromised. Uh, because very quickly you can gather a large amount of bandwidth that could take out uh, ver even very, very large websites or important, uh, important uh, sites across the world. Just a few more Japanese uh, statistics that we gathered. As we've said many times, uh, two to 300,000 of these are running uh, the vulnerable UPnP service on the LAN. Upwards of 500,000 are running just any UPnP server, which, as we've said many times, uh, is very dangerous to do. Um, we, did, we did notice the most common service that was exposed is HTTP. However, the vast majority of these servers are normal web servers for your favorite websites. 
Um, very few of them are actually modems or routers that expose these services remotely. So, uh, so where do you go from here? Um, yeah, so uh, as discussed before, um, the UPnP daemon in particular uh, has every type of vulnerability uh, in the book. Um, uh, we would recommend uh, to people building these devices that um, you know there there are open source uh, ready to use uh, stacks out there programs out there for doing UPnP um, and they are well much much better studied um, so uh, and like we said before the vulnerabilities that we found and we've talked about here um, literally. Uh, we threw into IDA Pro and uh, Control F for system. Um, so it's it's uh, it's it's not a game you're going to win trying to patch these vulnerabilities. Um, frankly, some of these daemons um, you just need to start over. Um, uh, another thing you can do. Um, to uh, shore up the defenses is um, employ modern exploit mitigations. Uh, there's been a lot of development in this uh, realm in the workstation space, uh, desktops, laptops. Uh, you know, when you're browsing the internet uh, and you're using, uh, for example, Chrome, uh, web pages are rendered in a deprivileged process. They are sandboxed. Uh, these concepts do not appear in the embedded world, uh, but there's no reason why they couldn't. Um, so there's, so uh, make it more difficult to exploit in the first place um, and in, in user space that amounts to uh, no execute, uh, keep using those stack and heap cookies, um, employ full ASLR, one, one uh, problem that a lot of people run into is uh, they think they've enabled ASLR. Um, enabling it on Linux uh, in the kernel is actually insufficient. Uh, you also have to compile the binaries that you want to randomize as PIE, as position independent executables. If you don't do that, uh, the dot text segment of the program is not randomized and less than full ASLR is about as useful as no ASLR. Um, and then in the kernel space, uh, uh, we were actually having a discussion about this last night. Um, there's a series of patches, if you're using Linux, um, that we recommend, we run, uh, frankly, um, that add a lot of these mitigations uh, to uh, stock mainline Linux, and there's a lot to be said on that, and if you're curious, I'll talk to you after. For hours. Talk. For hours. Um, but another thing to do is fail closed. Um, these UPnP daemons are listening on the internet. Um, we kind of doubt that that's actually necessary. Um, it's not, uh, they had separate update mechanisms. The UPnP daemon is not their update mechanism. Uh, frankly, the update mechanism should probably be the only thing, if, if anything at all. Uh, the update mechanism should be the only thing uh, listening on the internet. Um, and uh, if you do have uh, update systems, if you have, if you have the need to do remote administration, uh, ISPs sometimes require this, um, then do so with uh, you know, key-based authentication, and there's proven options out there for this. Um, so. uh, like we said before, uh, there's no reason to run everything as root. Um, you know, uh, even even with those command injection vulnerabilities, if that UPnP daemon was running as the user nobody, uh, we probably wouldn't be able to do a whole lot. Uh, but it's running as root. Uh, as much as possible, sandbox things. Um, Chrome does this. Uh, it's spreading to a lot of other programs. Uh, Adobe Reader uh, does this, actually uses uh, Chromium's uh, sandbox to a certain extent. 
Um, on Linux, this is implemented with SecComp BPF. Um, on Windows, uh, they don't actually have a proper sandboxing. Uh, some people might argue with me on that. Um, they have integrity levels, which is close. Uh, and then on OS X, there's seatbelt profiles. Um, and then finally, uh, if there is an open source tool that you can use, a FTP, HTTP, uh, UPnP, daemon, uh, use that. Um, often they are more audited. Uh, and more importantly, uh, as the vendor, if you get burned because there's a vulnerability in shared code, um, it doesn't look as bad because everyone runs that code. Okay, I guess I had a few more suggestions. Uh, <laughs> um, don't always does. <laughs> yeah. Um, encrypt and sign firmware. That would make it more difficult for us to do this analysis. Uh, deter physical access. Don't allow us to get root shells by just plugging into UARTs. Uh, don't give us JTAG. Um, and uh, whenever possible, don't write things in memory unsafe languages. Um, write it in Python or in Japan, Ruby is very popular. Write it in Ruby. Um, there are fewer classes of vulnerabilities uh, that you might expose. What doesn't work is um, trying to make it difficult to extract firmwares. Um, that will just delay people. And um, uh, owning infra hacking infrastructure is very much in vogue now. It's very popular. Um, as endpoints, as workstations have become more hardened, it's important to also take a look at what sits between you and the internet. Um, how many more do we have? The, enough. Uh, firewall everything off. Uh, protect your uh, protect everything in your internal network, uh, because NAT is not really sufficient. Uh, I know it's probably not a buzzword anymore, but defense in depth, protect everything on your inside network, um, because things can and will fail, especially things like embedded devices. Uh, whenever possible. Uh, run your own firmware. Um, things like OpenWRT, DDWRT are very uh, much more hardened, have been analyzed a lot more, and are generally safer. Let someone else be the lowest hanging fruit. So, so in conclusion, uh, we're hoping that there is more interest uh, and we can maybe help answer some questions about uh, researching Japanese modems and routers. Uh, we hope to release more data in the coming months on uh, how to pull apart these firmwares. Um, and uh, although neither of us speak more than a few phrases in Japanese, um, we were still able to understand how to attack these devices. Uh, the cultural barriers are not high enough. Uh, and finally, uh, the fixes aren't simple. Um, but we listed a few different things uh, that can help. Uh, we'd like to thank Google Translate, <laughs> uh, Yahoo Auctions, <laughs> and uh, take any uh, questions if anyone has any. Have the vendors committed to providing fixes? Uh, so uh, the um, yeah. So the question is. Uh, how have the vendors committed to providing the fixes? Um, so some of these, uh, it depends on the vulnerability, uh, frankly. Uh, so the uh, UPnP vulnerabilities, uh, we let them know about uh, months ago. Um, the HTTP vulnerabilities, which is why we were more uh, cagey, uh, we re revealed less information about, uh, those are more recent. Uh, so we're hoping to stick to um, you know, this three month-ish time frame. Um, but, uh, you know, 
we're understanding that the process in Japan is different than the process in the US. And um, patching embedded devices in general is very slow to begin with. Um, it, it's, you, you definitely are risking by remotely patching things, your entire internet infrastructure going down, and that's scary for uh, very uh, good reasons. Yeah, we have uh, um, at narfindustries.com slash codeblue 2014. We hope to add more information in the coming months um, on those items. Are you interested in doing research for any other country um, outside of Japan? Which one will be next? So uh, I don't want to speak for uh, Paul, but I've been looking. Uh, Repeat the question. Oh, uh, the question is, um, outside of Japan, what other countries are we looking at researching next? Um, I personally, uh, during some of my research, find a lot of the devices in China very interesting. Um, uh, they have a wide variety of services, and it's actually very disjointed. So I think there's a lot of interesting things there. But I also would like to look at uh, some Russian devices, which is similar, but there are less uh, remotely exposed services. So I think it, it would be interesting to look at those two. The reason why we looked at Japanese devices is our company has an office in Tokyo. Uh, and we were curious uh, what kind of code was running between us and the internet. Unfortunately, our expectations proved true. Uh, in that we didn't think the code was very secure. Um, but uh, we want to reiterate that if we were, uh, if we had an office in another country, uh, we would expect the exact same outcome. This is an international problem, uh, not just a Japanese one, uh, but we're hoping that there's more interest in the Japanese sector now. Thank you. One additional question. Which country do you think um, has the best practice or good practice in terms of home router? Which countries are more secure than others? So uh, the, que the question the is, question is <laughs> uh, which country do we think has the best security track record uh, for embedded devices? And uh, in my opinion, that's uh, like the, like, you know, the best of the worst. Uh, I, everyone still has these problems. Um, it's all the, bad. The <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, countries where more uh, reverse engineering of these devices and research has been performed, generally the devices are somewhat harder to attack, um, but. By and large, so the United States, for instance, has had people present at many, many black hats and DEF CONs uh, vulnerabilities in Verizon routers and Comcast routers, um, all the major ISPs, really. And we still have these vulnerabilities. Yeah. Um, they're slightly, they're, they're sometimes harder to exploit, but not all the time. So it really, no one is the most secure right now. Uh, it helps to, though, I think, to have a healthy uh, security research uh, community attacking uh, your own infrastructure. Um, and that's common in the US. It's common in the European Union. Uh, and perhaps we were just Googling poorly, but it didn't seem as common in Japan. Um, but at the end of the day, everyone keeps making the same mistakes in embedded devices. And so our suggestions for fixing the problem are not to try to patch all the vulnerabilities. It's to make them more costly to exploit. Thank you very much.